My out-of-studio partner on today's program is Greg Durrell. Greg, welcome back. Thanks again, Tom. We are in Romans chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. So let's get right to it. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That seems to be pretty uh, <laughs> pretty definite, pretty authoritative, doesn't it, uh, Greg? Well, no question. And I think before we get into the text, maybe we just ought to tell our listening audience that something occurs here in the book of Romans, which is somewhat unique, and mm-hmm. it'll be clear once we've gone through chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. But these three chapters are known as parenthetical chapters. In other words, when we begin in Romans 1 and take our way through Romans chapter 8, Paul is dealing with the issue or the theme of the righteousness of God and how do we obtain that. And he takes us all the way through a complete, in-depth theological study of what it means to be saved. In other words, justification. And then he moves into sanctification. And then ultimately, as we saw in Romans 8, glorification. But then he leaves the church itself, and he injects something here. So we say these are parenthetical. And Paul begins, he's going to begin a discussion concerning the nation of Israel. Now, that's important, and we need to know that focus going in, because for many people, all the promises and things made to Israel in the Old Testament are fulfilled in the church. And if we have this presupposition, then we're going to tend to try to twist what we see in these next three chapters. Like, for example, where we see Israel, we're going to try to mentally read in church. And that's something we can never do. Things that are different are not the same. Where the Bible means Israel, it says Israel. Where it means the church, it says church. So what we're going to see is Paul now is inserting something here for consideration and certainly to demonstrate the sovereignty of God. But the focus here, as we're going to see, is the nation of Israel. So I just thought we need Mm -hmm. to really say that before we get into it. Greg, I think that's very important because uh, certainly in the Protestant church, the evangelical church, there is a growing idea that we have replaced, the church has replaced Israel. Sure. And Roman Catholicism has always had that position. That's my point, that in dealing with these issues with regard to, and this is what the program's about, we, Greg is a former Roman Catholic, I'm a former Roman Catholic, and we're trying to go through the scriptures and address many things that we were taught as Roman Catholics that are not true to the Word of God. That's why the name of the program is According to God's Word. That has to be our authority. That has to be what we go by, because this is Christ's teaching. (laughs) It's simple as that. Now, replacement theology. What does that do? Somebody might say, well, what's the big deal? Surely Christ has been rejected by the Jews, and who else could take its place except the church? The vicar of Christ, the pope in Rome, says this continually. Although he has recognized Israel, his view is is that the church needs to take over even that land, that area, so that it can become a religious place for all religions, not just Christianity, uh, but certainly Islam as well. You know, you make a a good point when when you said that Israel or the Jew rejected Christ. And that's true, and that was prophesied that that would occur. But the issue is, did Christ reject the Jew? Did Christ reject Israel? And I think that's, this is Paul's whole point here. People talk about election. Well, the election of whom, and then the election of whom to what? If, if we just arbitrarily dismiss Israel, I, I tell people all the time, you know, so when you read the Old Testament, God made certain promises to Israel, and they will agree. And I'll say that he made certain promises of discipline to Israel when they were disobedient, and they would say that's true. And I'll say, well, then, do you think all the promises of God's discipline to the nation of Israel, were they literal? And they say, well, of course they were. You can, you can read that in the Scripture. Okay, fine. Now, his promises of blessing, are they literal, too? And they'll say, well, well, no, no, those are spiritual. Those are fulfilled in the church. Well, where do you find that in Scripture? You don't. And I think that's why Paul, in the most important theological book of the Bible, the book of Romans, I think that's why, after he brings us to the marvelous passages we just concluded last time, 
Romans uh, chapter 8, looking at from 34, actually from 31 down to 39, giving us this great hope, this great expectation. He says, now, knowing the body of Christ is secure, now let us address the present condition and the future condition of the nation of Israel. And that's what he begins to do in chapter Mm 9. Now, the only way that you miss that is that you approach the text with a presupposition. Someone has told you that Israel doesn't mean Israel. If that's the case, then maybe hell doesn't mean hell. Maybe heaven doesn't mean heaven. And, and there, there's no basis for that. You and I both know, coming up, we were just told to believe things. And we just believed them because the Church said so. Exactly. Well, we, we can't approach the Word of God that way. We have to approach it as authoritative. So if the Word of God declares something to be so, then leave it alone. Let it, let it be what it is, and, and don't try to meddle with it. But a lot of people, Tom, and you and I know a lot of them, they just have this unusual desire, even though they would say Rome is wrong, they'll take the same position with Rome where the nation of Israel is concerned. Mm-hmm. Greg, there are so many simple <laughs> ways of, of refuting this whole idea of replacement theology, but too many people today are just not getting it. For example, you talk about the promises God gave to Israel, and they're unconditional promises. Mm -hmm. They're based on him, not on the performance of Israel. Yes, Israel in its performance, God's going to discipline and has discipline and he he deals with. But the promises that are unconditional, for example, the land. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob gave them the land, all right? Now, let's say, let's put the church in there. What land has he given the church? (laughs) Good point. It just doesn't happen. It's not there. So, uh, as I said, there are so many things about this that are erroneous, uh, the belief in in replacement theology. Well, let's continue on here, and we'll see Paul's heart for the Jews. can Can I chase one rabbit? Sure. Since you brought it up, what land did he give the church? We know he gave the Jew land. What land did he give the church? None. Now, what nation did he give the Jew national status? Yes, he did. The nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. Did he ever give the church national status? And the answer is no. No. No, all the all the admonitions for the nation of Israel to contend for their nation, run their nation according to the law, etc., certainly are biblical for the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. The church has no nation. But yet we find people today saying civil activism and the new gospel of the new morality should be the banner for the nation of the church, which is no such thing. But Greg, let's take this closer to Rome, this whole idea. What about the nation? What about the Vatican nation? Isn't that in Scripture? Yeah, it's in Scripture. (laughs) It's in Scripture. (laughs) And and it's it's a good thing that it is, because it tells the Bible believer what to watch out for. And anyone that would try to circumvent the promises made to Israel and the national legitimacy of that nation, that that the King of kings and Lord of lords is going to return to one day and rule and reign from that sovereign nation, Israel, the enemy has to in some way try to replace or supplant that. Mm -hmm. And that's done, obviously, uh, through the Vatican and and, and through ultimately this idea of replacement theology. Yeah. And I don't see anywhere in Scripture where Jesus returns to to Rome, to Vatican City, and so on. Not at all. As a nation. Well, let's continue on with this to to catch Paul's heart in this. Again, verse 1, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And that doesn't sound like God has written off the Jews, does it? If it, if it is, then Paul doesn't seem to be going along with, with what God has done or is doing. Well, you're right. And, and the language in verse 3 is clear. He says, my brethren. Somebody would say, well, that's fellow church people. But then he says, my kinsmen or my relatives. And then he says, according to the flesh. So Paul was what? Paul was a Jew. Paul's talking about Jews. And if you don't get it in verse 3, verse 4, he makes it real clear. He says, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Now, 
just if you just read those opening passages there, those opening verses, how then, without someone having told you aforetime to believe something, without some presupposition, how would you just read in the church there? They're intellectually, I mean, if you're intellectually honest, you can't do that. Because Paul is clearly telling you, I'm talking about the Jewish people. I'm talking about the nation of Israel. His sorrow was for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people that temporarily had rejected Messiah. Mm-hmm. And and how, how do you dance around that? I don't know. I don't know how they do it. Well, you might as well pick the people from Rhode Island or from California. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not in the Word of God, and it, it's not consistent, certainly, with Paul's words here, written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But we'll go on. Verse 5, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, Amen. So, Jesus did not come to any group other than the Jews. He didn't come to the Gentiles. He came for the Gentiles, but he didn't come into the race of Gentiles. He came to the Jews. You know, something else I think needs to be said here, too, concerning the movie The Passion and the subject we're on here. There was a lot of fervor about there was going to be a rise of anti-Semitism because of the movie. And I think the reason that 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 maybe was was fostered along was because historically the quote unquote visible church has been anti Semitic. Roman Catholicism, for example, historically has been anti Semitic up until about the last two years ago. Up until the last two years ago they refused to agree that Israel had a right to exist. If we go back and we look at the persecution for the nation of Israel down through after the diaspora in 70 A.D., uh, through the Middle Ages, through through the Reformation, we find Rome at the heart of that anti-Semitism. We even look at people, whether it's Franco from Spain, Tito from Yugoslavia, Castro, Hitler, for example. Hitler was never excommunicated from the Catholic Church, never. Six months after he came to power, he signed a concordat or a concordant with the Vatican, uh, allowing them to be an official religion of the Third Reich, or, or to freely practice in his in his domain. So we look at these things, and from a Jewish perspective, when you say Christian, you're saying Catholic, you're saying anti-Semitism. Right. And so I could see why perhaps some Jews would say this movie could spark uh, anti-Semitism. But if we read what Paul's saying here, there is no basis for anti-Semitism at all. Because the Messiah is Jewish. Overwhelmingly, the authors of the, the Bible are Jewish. It's a Jewish book about Jewish people and a Jewish Messiah who comes to redeem them, and us Gentiles are grafted in by his grace. Right. How could you be anti-Semitic? And again, we mentioned it earlier, all of the promises are to the Jews. Exactly. <laughs> okay? And God will, they're based on him, on his love for them, and he will fulfill that. They're not conditional upon anything else. Greg, we've got about a minute here. You know, my concern for those listening is that we need to go not by what we think, that is, ideas that may come in and out of our heads or what some man-made authority might teach. We need to get back to God's Word. Jesus said, if you abide in my Word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's our encouragement to everyone listening. We are saying some things here, but check us out. Get into God's Word. See if these things are so. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to the BereanCall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is TheBereanCall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. 
I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24-7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back.